Going to kick off. Thank you for waiting and sorry for the delayed start. Um, but we think we need to uh, kick off because we'll have to finish close to time. And um, first of all, welcome to this panel. You may have noticed it's been slightly renamed in the uh, agenda today as uh, Sensible Cities, but it's about resilience originally. So what we're really here to see is new and emerging sensing technologies for urban resilience applications. Um, and we're really sort of fo focusing a bit more narrowly in what we see as a little bit scanning the future and scanning within what's going on in cities for mapping, modeling, data collection. My name is Edward Anderson and I'm working for the World Bank's country office in Tanzania. My background is disaster risk management, um, particularly from risk modeling. So I'm very interested in new tools and techniques cities can begin to take advantage of for the topic of disaster risk management in particular, but as you'll see, I think it's very broad across sectors. And we have a panel of technologists and policymakers, and I'll introduce them all quite briefly, and I think we'll go one by one and then have a discussion at the end until we get kicked out. So um, our first speaker, some of you may have heard Frank Sedler speaking yesterday. He was one of the uh, Ignite talks. So. Frank's really a focus on urban resilience. He's been working in flood issues in Jakarta. He comes from the University of Michigan. And uh, he's looking really at social media, drones, and wireless networks, the whole plethora of new technologies at the grassroots level and what they can bring to the city. Then our next speaker is Dirk Gorison. Dirk is a uh, runaway academic, if you read his profile. But what I really like about Dirk, besides being a technologist in general, he works for a number of drone and UAV applications, including Skycap in South Africa, and he consults with the World Bank in Tanzania. And his focus is really on finding the right tool for the job. So we're not really here to promote specific platforms, but understand their capabilities, their fit for fitness for use. And then we have another UAV company, um, Ian Smith, who is the um, chief technologist, effectively, at Dell Air Tech, certainly for English language countries. Um, Ian is and a flight instructor, and an aviation fuels expert. And he loves the smell of jet fuel in the morning. <laughs> so we're, as you might see, we're scaling up a little bit a sort of spectrum of technologies from the grassroots to a variety of consumer and low cost applications to more capable, more professional platforms. But here to really sort of tell us what to make of all of this and how to proceed is Denise McKenzie. Denise director of the Open Geospatial Consortium. Now, Denise has job takes all over the world. She represents to the UN, to the industry. She lobbies and advocates for good standards to adopt geospatial data and how we can take advantage of this and what it all means. So I'm hoping Denise will be able to wrap up some of what we heard today. So let's begin by inviting Frank to tell us a little bit about his work in Jakarta and away you go. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, my name is Frank Sedlar. I'm a graduate student there at the University of Michigan, where I'm looking at issues of urban resilience, right? How do we balance climate change, growing populations, growing cities, to ensure the well-being of the citizens and the infrastructure in, in the years to come? In particular, I'm working in Jakarta, Indonesia. Now, Jakarta has a very severe problem with flooding. It's been going on for quite some time now, and there's been many, many projects that have attempted to solve Jakarta's problem, even get a handle, even provide new data on it, um, all with somewhat limited success. So what we're doing here, myself as part of the Pay to Jakarta project, is looking to, to crowdsource a lot of data on flooding from the citizens of, of Jakarta. Jakarta has about 28 million people living within its city. Um, surely these people are, are saying something about flooding. Indonesia also has the the I believe first high, the highest rate of Twitter usage in the world, third highest Facebook usage in the world. Everyone has two, if not three, smartphones that they're constantly on, even as we see here in the middle of a flood. What, what are these people saying about the actual flooding, about the conditions um, in this mass of tweets and Facebook posts and SMS messages? Surely there's some data here that we can mine. So this was the idea behind Pay to Jakarta. Basically, People would send geolocated tweets um, it, saying flood, not flood, uh, in their certain areas. And we would 
uh, collect all this data into what's known as Pated Jakarta, the map, an online mapping service, to build a real-time flood map of the city. Now, this is the picture of all the geolocated tweets in Jakarta from last year's monsoon season. Every single tweet that said Banjir, which is uh, it, which means flood in Bahasa, Indonesia. So clearly from the, these tweets, there's, there's some power to crowdsourcing data. And, and what we're doing is taking all these tweets and building this online mapping service, which you can find on paytojakarta.org, which is basically real-time, up-to-date, very fine-scale, um, a very fine-scale picture of how flooding is traveling in Jakarta. Now, this data is accessible by anyone uh, with an inter internet connection. Uh, and, and has already been doing a lot to to build to help the safety of the residents, but also build begin building resilience in Jakarta. Now, let me back up a slide here. This is this is all based on a, on a mobile phone and specifically the social media apps on that mobile phone. We're beginning to think, though, what, what if we can do a similar approach, a similar crowdsourcing mentality to consumer drones? Now, if some of you saw my talk last night, this is somewhat similar, but we're in a new era of unmanned aerial vehicles or drones. Uh, what I've got here, and this is, will not be flying today, but this is a, a DJI Phantom, um, more or less a, a pretty standard consumer grade drone that you can buy off Amazon for a thousand US dollars. Um, not attached now, but you can attach a, a GoPro camera for an additional $500. And suddenly you have this incredibly powerful data collection um, device in, in your hands. It's ridiculously easy to fly. One battery gives you about 20 minutes of flight time. And you can cover basically two square kilometers on a single battery. Uh, ridiculously powerful. So we're thinking, you know, how do, you, how do we harness these drones for, among other things, flooding, information on flooding, like we're doing with uh, Twitter and mobile phones in Jakarta. Now, the interesting thing with these drones is, is we're kind of already able to do this to some extent. Um, I'll skip that. We're, we're able to do this because these, these drones are, are already, they've saturated our cities, uh, more or less. Boston is a city of 600,000 people, 125 square kilometers. Um, so to completely cover Boston with a drone um, would only take 71 drones, or about one drone every 10,000 people. Barcelona a million more people than Boston in a slightly smaller area. And in this case, it would only take 58 drones to completely cover Barcelona in, in a drone coverage, a drone map, or one drone every 30,000 people. And finally, in Jakarta's case, uh, one, of the, one of the largest cities in the world, over 10 million people in, in the second largest urban footprint in the world, we're still only looking at less than 400 drones to completely cover Jakarta with, with a drone uh, and the, the data and the photographs provided by such drones. Um, which, this is a pretty exciting thing, right? Because I guarantee you that already each of these cities have at least this many drones, if not double, triple, even quadruple, the, the drones I've quickly calculated here. Um, these things are flying off the shelves. Citizens all over the world have these things. The question becomes how to turn, how to harness the data that we collect from these drones into something that can be used by cities uh, used collectively rather than just kind of a novelty that each individual person is, is flying. So as an example of what we're hoping to do with these drones in Jakarta, um, let's see if that plays, is, is map. What we see here is this very same drone flying over the Chiliwan River in central Jakarta. And what we're trying to do is map the communities on either side of, of the river here. We see the, the traditional Google imagery that we had been using uh, in the past. And you, you can notice the difference between that imagery and what we get from this drone. Uh, this imagery, of course, is, can always be updated. It's basically free once you purchase the drone. And to be honest, we, I was letting the, the local community leaders fly this drone themselves. You know, that's how easy it is to fly. You don't need a team of professionals to fly this. You know, anyone can be flying this thing. So with that data, with this mapping, what we're doing then is importing it into OpenStreetMaps. Um, this is the same area on OpenStreetMap. Uh, and we're trying to map out every road and every building in this area. It's still kind of a work in progress. Um, but again, this is something the community themselves can do, the citizens themselves can do. It's a question of how do we harness the data collected from these drones over a large extent of the city. 
zooming out a bit of, of Jakarta here, this is a, a wider section of central Jakarta. And the ideal thing that, that we'd love to do with these drones, um, using kind of those 376 drones that are in Jakarta right now, at least, is during a flood, when, when the rain clouds are still in the sky and preventing s satellites or planes from collecting imagery, to have those citizens send up these drones themselves, every part of the city, collect all this data, um, which we can then, if we could somehow aggregate this at a, at a city level, we could see what, what streets are flooded, where the flood's traveling. Even um, pending the development of, of a couple sensors, how deep the flood water is, how fast it's moving in certain areas, right? This is extremely powerful data that in a city as large as Jakarta, and really any city for that matter, to get that kind of detailed, extensive information, you, you need some distributed network, um, which we think is going to come about through drones. So this is kind of just a new era of, of drones in cities, specifically crowdsourcing drones. You know, of course, there's a number of legal, technical, and uh, practical issues that must first be overcome. Namely, drones, for the most part, are illegal to fly in cities around the world. Um, you can sometimes get by as a hobbyist, but really any large-scale organized drone flights under current regulations are illegal. So the question that we're, we're working with now is how do you relax these regulations to allow citizens to fly their drones and to collectively harness that data to be used for, for the good of the city. Um, this data exists out there right now. We've seen it, a similar crowdsourcing mentality with mobile phones and social media. How do we take it now to, the, to this new technology, uh, which is drones? So thank you very much. And with that, I'll turn it back to you. Excellent. Um, good, well, good afternoon, I guess, everyone. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm going to give a, a brief overview of just maybe step back, just UAVs, um, what kind of UAVs or drones do you have? Uh, what kind of applications um, could they be used for, and especially in a city context? Um, so, but maybe first a, a little trivia. I mean, who, who recognizes the person in this picture? Nobody? Well. It's Marilyn Monroe, and she's busy working on an aerial target drone. Um, so, you know, just introduce the terminology here. So I typically talk about UAVs, or unmanned aerial vehicles, but, you know, popular press has picked up on the word drone. Um, and that word actually comes from, has its heritage in, in, the, in the military, of course, um, as radio-controlled aerial targets. It's something Marilyn Monroe used to help build, which is interesting. Um, anyway, I'm here with my representing SkyCap and ShadowView, so uh, just a brief background of, of what those two organizations do. So ShadowView is a nonprofit foundation uh, which grew out of helicopter work in marine conservation. And they've flown missions all over the world in quite a few different places, all focusing around conservation, anti-poaching, environmental monitoring, those kind of things. Um, and they've done you know, some work in the UK around illegal hunting, and uh, very recently they even, I think, were the first uh, to use a UAV. It was flown at night and led, directly led to the capture of two poachers, which were actually um, later shot um, when they were approached by rangers. Um, there's an interesting moral conundrum there. Um, but so that shadow of background in conservation. Um, operations all over the world, really. Uh, some work with the Dutch Red Cross, um, in uh, Sicily looking at illegal drift net fishing, uh, South Africa anti-poaching, uh, bonobo tracking in Borneo, um, looking at shark and manta ray populations in Australia, illegal deer hunting in the US, um, and with a wide range of, of various uh, organizations in the conservation space. Uh, one of the more interesting projects that's going on at the moment uh, is looking at mine detection. So using a very lightweight ground penetrating radar, uh, flying at a, a certain height, can you pick up landmines and can you automatically detect where they are? Um, so uh, so th that, that's very promising, but still actively ongoing. And then very related to the stuff Matt, um, Frank was talking about, so how can you, uh, how can you empower local, local citizens 
to build maps of their own area. Um, so Missing Maps is a project that's come out of uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, Red Cross, and human Humanitarian Open Street Map. They're trying to do very similar things, uh, what, um, what Frank is doing. And I, I really hope we can bring these things together and, and work together, because um, it's all doing, trying to aim for the same goal. Um, so then Skype is a very new company. Um, I think it was only officially founded something um, in July, which is kind of grew out of the conservation work that Shadowview was doing and some of the profits they feed back into the foundation. And it's, they position themselves as an end-to-end -end service provider, uh, mapping, inspection, disaster response, and using both custom built but also off-the-shelf uh, platforms, both rotary and fixed wing. So just to talk about drones and the types of drones. So these are rotary drones. These are the ones most people would probably be familiar from with in, from popular press. And they come in all shapes and sizes. So you have your standard quadcopters, which have four propellers. You have hexacopters, with six propellers, or even more. Um, and flight times give you roughly 20 to 60 minutes, you know, a range between 1 and 10 kilometers. Price can vary widely from $300 to $60,000, even more. Um, so, I mean, these numbers are just ballparks. There's a lot of variation. A lot depends on the sensors and the training and, and all the rest of it. So don't, you know, this is just there to illustrate, give you an idea roughly what kind of ballpark we're talking about. Um, but they're very popular and uh, they use quite a bit. I mean, the, the one on the bottom right, um, that's a Falcon 8, uh, which uh, we currently use for inspection. You know, that's a $50,000 uh, airframe because it comes with very strong reliability uh, guarantees, for example. Um, so there's a whole spectrum of, of different um, platforms. It all depends on what you want to do and what your needs are. Fixed wing UAVs, so unlike the rotary aircraft, um, these need some kind of runway or a catapult, or they need more, typically more space to launch and to, to land. Um, and they, they don't take off, take off vertically like um, uh, rotary aircraft. And again, they, they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, from you know, ranging from the, the small foam, foam aircraft for a few hundred dollars all the way up to you know, $100,000 aluminum um, high-end high -end aircraft can do you know, hundreds of kilometers. Um, so again, wide range of things, it all kinds of depends. Uh, what's your need, uh, what, what, what kind of sensors you want to carry, what kind of data do you want to collect, what kind of accuracy, et cetera. And this is really the key thing, and I know Ian will really go more into depth about that, about this, and have some really cool examples to show you, because, I mean, the platform itself, it's nice, it's fun, it's a toy, you can fly, but what we really care about is all the data that comes off the cameras or, or the various sensors you carry. And there's a, a wide variety uh, here as well. So you have your standard visible cameras, which you just like your own, you know, your point and shoot cameras you, you use normally. That you can give you aerial imagery. You have LIDAR, um, so it's essentially infrared, which can tell you about, uh, you know, um, give you in information about uh, height, you know, uh, look at um, um, digital terrain models and things like that. Thermal cameras, um, multi, -hyper multi and hyperspectral cameras, which can give you information about um, vegetation or geology, what kind of um, sediments do you have, or wh wh where, where, if you're looking at a farm, you know which which parts of wh which area of my crop do I need to water more? Um, so these kind of things. Radar I mentioned for the mining thing we're looking at, uh, we're using uh, air quality sensors. There's a whole bunch of different sensors you can you can fly on these things, and it depends exactly what your needs are. Um, but the accuracy you can get with these things, especially in the mapping case, is is very good. You know, you talk about centimeter level accuracy. In some cases, even below that. Uh, which is something you can't really get from satellites. And there's lots and lots of application areas, anything from surveying to flood risk management, uh, conservation, filming. And I'll just flip through a number of these just in the context of cities, some of the things you, you know, you, you might be relevant uh, to your own use case. And the most obvious one is, of course, mapping, so getting an area, uh, get mapping out an area. So I think this is a picture from Cape Town looking at illegal set, uh, settlements. So you know, if you have a slum, what's the extent? How is it growing? Um, how does that impact safety and access? Uh, those kind of things. But also important for land use management, uh, for la well, yeah, land use management, but also land rights. So who owns what part of the land? Um, these kind of very accurate maps are important for that. Damage assessment: the classical example being what happened in the Philippines. Um, so you know, you've had a disaster. How do you gauge? You know. Where, where, do you, where do you need to prioritize? Where do you need to send resources? Again, aerial imagery, UAVs can be a very quick way of, of gathering that kind of information. Traffic management, again, for obvious reasons, gives you an eye in the sky, some situation awareness. How do you, do you manage uh, accidents or, or improve the flow of traffic? Flood risk assessment, um, again, this is something Frank talked about, so again, obvious applications. 
And this is both before the floods to, to gather actual digital elevation models to predict wh where the floods may have most impact, as well as after the flood to look at emergency response. Surveying inspection is another big use case, uh, bridges, pipelines, and I'm sure um, Ian will, will touch more on, on that. Um, they have some very, very cool stuff there. Um, this, is, uh, this is a picture I took from, um, I think it's a startup in, in the US, um, which is all about package delivery. Um, so they're, they're building this kind of like a, a, a drop box which you could hang outside your balcony if you live in a densely populated uh, area. And then ideally your Amazon drone will come and hover, uh, hover above the box, drop the package, and you, know, you have your, your delivery straight to your door, even if you live on the 20th floor in some apartment block somewhere. Uh, pollution, mo oh, sorry. pollution monitoring uh, is another use case. You see these things being used for. You can have regular flights at different altitudes and, and look at you know, various levels of, of, of toxins and, 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 and emissions. Uh, vegetation, this is really predominantly an agricultural use case, but again, using hyperspectral and multispectral cameras, you can estimate the water content in plants, and you, so that can give you an indication where do I need to water more, or where do I need to spray more pesticides, and that kind of information. Uh, security, thermal cameras um, can give you, well, you know, if, you're, if you need to secure an area for, for various reasons, um, again, these things can provide situational awareness. But not just for our security, you can use the same sensors to look at energy usage. So I, I don't remember exactly where this picture came from, um, but you can, you know, you can fly over a re residential area and start, start looking, okay, where's the heat loss happening? Which homes do I need to insulate more, uh, et cetera? And that can provide useful information. First response, um, this is from a, a demo with the uh, Dutch Red Cross. Uh, again, something you've probably seen, um, seen quite a bit about uh, in this case, you know, delivering a defibrillator. So you can imagine there's a first response team, something happens, can you automatically um, get first aid or in this case a defibrillator over there? Now, it's very nice as a demo, but there's huge practical and legal implications of how you actually do this and power requirements and the rest of it. But you know, these kind of ideas are currently being explored and things you can think about. Virtual tours, uh, this is something that was done on the shadow view side in how can you give people a virtual safari experience. So by flying uh, specifically 360 cameras, you can capture like a nice 360 view of a particular area, and which you can then link with something like an Oculus Rift, and then you can give people this kind of virtual safari experience. But you can do the same things for virtual tours in cities. Uh, so there's currently some work with, uh, I think, the city of Rotterdam, I think, to how, how can you kind of give that same kind of experience. Um, though in all of that, so there's lots of these applications, and there's lots of very cool stuff you can do, and there's lots of very cool stuff people are already doing. Um, but whenever you talk about drones, or especially in the, in the presence of lawyers and, and politicians, um, you know, people always worry about these kind of things. And, and that, that's true. You, know, you should worry about these kind of things. And the, there's a big issue at the moment with regulations and certification requirements. That's all very much in flux. Um, that's being worked on by different countries and by different authorities, and every country will have their own set of rules, and people are starting to work together, but this is still you know, very much in flux. Um, but in the meantime, you know, people are using these things, and, and you know, rightfully so, they bring a lot of benefits, but if, if you're thinking of deploying these in your own cities or your own areas, you do have to very be aware of what the risks associated. And so there's quite a number of examples, you know, um, the triathlete hit, hit by, a, by a drone, or a, there's a woman, this was, I think, just yeah, November 15th, so you know, just <laughs> a couple of days ago, um, a woman in a market uh, somewhere in the US uh, got hit. Um, drones apparently almost collided with an NYPD helicopter. Um, again, some drones suddenly came falling down in the middle of Manhattan, luckily didn't hit anybody. Um, so you know, these kind of things you have to be aware of, and how do you manage those risks? Um, and so this is why it's very important to you know, be aware of the regulatory environment, to work with your local civil aviation authority, be it the CAA, be it the FAA, or whatever. And if you're working with operators or you're commissioning people to fly drones, you know, are they, you know, what are the rules? Are they working according to the rules? Um, are they properly certified and trained and all the rest of it? And that's a really important aspect to all of this. So just to, to wrap up, so I mean, a bit of a high-level overview. I mean, the UAV technology in the market itself is still at very early stage. There's a lot happening. There's a huge variety of platforms, and the technology is really evolving. And Ian will, will show definitely some really cool things about how, how those boundaries are being pushed. Um, and there's a huge variety of platforms and sensors. It depends very much. You know, it's all about thinking, what exactly do you need? What data do you need? What, what are you interested in? And backtracking from there, OK, what kind of platform does that mean I need to use? 
Um, the system's currently a very automatic, but actually quite low autonomy. The word autonomous is used very loosely, but actually we're not, you know, we're not nearly uh, as autonomous as we maybe think we are. Um, and UAVs generally give you, they give you high resolution imagery and they're, they're very quick to task, uh, much faster so than satellites. Though satellites themselves, that technology is changing. Um, I think initially it was planned for somebody from Skybox or from Planet Labs to be here, uh, but they're doing some really interesting things um, in this space. And so, but because of those things, high resolution, et cetera, you typically use them for smaller areas. So if you're gonna, you know, if you need to map 2,000 square kilometers, or whatever, you're probably not gonna use a UAV satellite. It makes much more sense. Uh, and then finally, the regulatory environment, I said, is still very much in flux, but it is very important, especially urban environments, you know, a lot high population, this is a key challenge. And in most parts of the world, it's actually forbidden um, or there's no regulation. Um, so you really need to be aware of that. Privacy is another big thing. You know, you have these things flying around with cameras. You know, what does that mean for privacy? Um, and so it's key, you know, to really work closely with your local civil aviation authority, understand the rules and regulations and, and how you're supposed to operate and, and use um, certified and or properly trained operators. And that's all. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ian Smith. I am from Houston, Texas. Uh, I work for a company called Delaire Tech. It's a French UAV manufacturer. So just to kind of touch on the previous points, um, understanding a bit more why UAVs and drones are currently such a hot topic. Uh, with the advent of the smartphone and its uh, incredible popularity, all of these little sensors were miniaturized into such a small package and made so cheap and affordable to, to manufacture and easy to acquire that we've shrinked them even more and basically have gotten military technology almost overnight. Um, so things like accelerometers and gyroscopes, which are in your phones when you play these games, are inside the UAVs and they're taking that data from how the UAV is positioned during each of its photos, and it's called the metadata. And then that is attached to the photos, along with GPS coordinates from the GPS sensors, um, and many other sensors that can give you extreme amounts of data at very affordable costs. So this is what we're dealing with, and it's um, just exploding at a very rapid pace. So for the smart cities of the future that really need to be resilient and um, keep up and, and set trends, uh, we really do see a lot of uh, potential UAVs um, being used in these cities. Uh, just for an example, um, this is a Delairtec DT-18. This is our first UAV. Um, it's a small fixed-wing UAV. Uh, it's battery-powered. It has a 1.8 meter wingspan, and it only weighs 2 kilograms. So it's very easy to launch. Uh, you launch it by your hand, and it lands on its belly. Uh, it actually has 100 kilometers of range and up to two hours of endurance. Um, this UAV in particular also has 3G and 4G LTE modems inside the actual drone in its small package. Uh, so the day of buying a data plan for your drone is here. It's, uh, it's among us and it's definitely going to be becoming more popular in the future. Um, so these are the kinds of platforms that you can use in these cities of the future and my presentation will focus just a bit more on the fixed wing aspect, but really a lot of these applications I'll show you can be accomplished by multi-rotor UAVs as well, the small helicopter rotary, rotary uh, variants. So here's just a chart I put together. It's kind of taking into account a disaster scenario. So it's comparing the standard methods of helicopters, airplanes, and satellites for getting data and throwing the UAV, the small UAV component in there. So you can see the UAV section is yellow um, and it touches on some very, very, very fine points uh, that are important in a disaster scenario for the cities of the future. Um, reactivity, affordability, real time and flexibility. 
Um, you know, satellites, uh, you can notice that satellite endurance isn't quite up there because typically uh, if there's clouds or weather crowding the area, then you're not going to be able to get a reliable image from a satellite. And also you only have a small window each time the satellite orbits the Earth to actually get the data on the actual site that you need. So the big, big thing I think personally with UAVs is the reactivity, the ability to just launch the UAV as soon as possible. Uh, DJI Phantom, the small $500 to $1,000 UAV, takes about two minutes to launch. You're up in the air, you're getting data almost immediately. Um, it's, it's very flexible, it flies below the clouds in, in a kind of an area that helicopters and airplanes don't operate in. So it's just filling this gap that we never really, I guess, realized was there to be filled. But the small UAVs really can do it and they can do it for cheap price and they're extremely flexible. So I'm also talking about Jakarta, Indonesia, it turns out. Um, it's a very unique city. Uh, it's it's huge, sprawling area. Um, one of the most populous urban uh, agglomerations in the entire world with uh, 28 million inhabitants in the actual Jakarta proper and the en environs of the outside. Um, it is a huge place and you kind of have to be there to believe it. It uh, just kind of grew faster than it uh, could keep up with. And Jakarta is sinking. It has an average elevation of eight meters uh, above sea level. 40% of the city is below sea level and uh, the, there are two major rivers that converge on Jakarta and also with the very uh, frequent rainy seasons. Um, I believe only four months out of the year, it's not the rainy season. So it's a huge problem with flooding, um, inadequate drainage, uh, combined with the rivers and the rain and the huge growth and surge in population, uh, they just couldn't keep up. So it's a big, big problem. Uh, there are plans for a dike to be built, but that's not happening until 2025 and it's still not uh, for sure. So this is going to be a problem that Jakarta is going to face uh, for the foreseeable future and there has to be something done um, to combat it. Uh, in 2013, it was the last big, big flood in Jakarta. Um, they estimate that it's around every five years is whenever the um, floods happen. Uh, but the last ones were 96, 2002, 2007, and 2013. Uh, they're expecting something else in the next couple of years, and it's inevitable. Uh, 47 people died, 20,000 were evacuated, countless more were affected by it, and um, the waters were very high. Uh, so to deal with this, uh, it was just the traditional methods, uh, airplanes, helicopters, and the like. So UAVs are going to help to touch on kind of the big uh, points in this, this entire purpose of this panel, uh, to democratize the access of information before and during disasters to save the lives and to help the cities uh, just run more efficiently in general. Uh, you can do so many more things with UAVs and all of this data that's all in the cloud and that's being collected than just natural disasters, uh, but it's uh, nice to have a, a bonus to strive for as well. So the first thing is prevention. Um, UAVs can do a lot of things uh, with prevention. Uh, planning, mapping, monitoring, and improving. So planning development projects with UAV aid. Um, in the examples I'll show, or you'll see that there are just very rapid and quick maps that can be created by UAVs that are very, very accurate and that bypass traditional ground methods by light years in the affordability, the, the quickness, and the entire scope in such a short amount of time, uh, which can help map areas of risk uh, you can use those maps to strategize on evacuation routes. Um, monitoring rivers for erosion to kind of pinpoint the areas that are next going to be affected in the, in the next major flood and improving the overall uh, efficiency of the in entire operation. These images are images that were captured from the UAVs and we do a lot of different things with them. Um, we can stitch them together into these very, very long, long images called ortho mosaics or create some of these other images that you're seeing here, which you'll see in um, full video uh, in just a second. But you can even get very, very accurate land survey maps. So just for an example, this isn't having to do with um, uh, disaster response, but this image at the bottom, um, kind of desert, was 
a 100, and this is just a, a snippet of it, but it was a 130 kilometer corridor that we uh, used the DT-18 UAV in Niger, connecting Niamey to um, a smaller city to the southeast, and it was for a um, railroad to be constructed. And we used the DT-18 to do that. It took uh, three weeks to do, 130 kilometers. It sounds like a lot, but that's with processing. And it was actually two to three times faster, as well as two to three times cheaper than traditional ground-based methods. So it, it's really becoming a tool uh, very fast. It's just, can the cities implement it and use it for their infrastructures? Um, as I said before, the reactivity is, is key for the UAVs uh, to, to be effective. Um, this is why they are so effective, and in the future why you're going to be seeing so much interaction with UAVs. I mean, it doesn't even go uh, again, to just disasters, uh, reactivity. Whenever I buy a package from Amazon, I want it now. Uh, if a UAV can get it to me, uh, that's great. So the, the way it relates more to disasters, though, is, um, well, you'll see here in, in this map, actually. This is actually taken in Jakarta, Indonesia. This is a series of still photographs that were stitched together by software using algorithms to create something called a 3D point cloud. Um, this is a harbor in Jakarta. Uh, it was mapped in the, with the DT-18. It took 20 minutes to do this in the flight and less than three hours to process this entire 3D point cloud. Uh, the resolution is down to about five to six centimeters per pixel. So each little dot on there is uh, five to six centimeters. So it's a very, very quick way to get a, a qu very quick map. Um, you can see, at, however, that the water around these ships is not very um, pronounced. It's hard for the software to map the water. So that's, um, in the future, it's going to be becoming uh, uh, much easier to do this with future software updates. So the UAV is just the tool for collecting the data. We need to process that data and make it useful for the cities as well. Um, this is just a proof of concept, just something quick. I mean, uh, it was 20 minute flight and uh, that's one, one-sixth of the entire endurance um, of the DT-18. So when every second counts, again, we need to rely on UAVs and new technology and to get these, um, these details from these people. Um, you know, when Frank was saying that uh, it can be crowdsourced uh, from all of these UAVs together in one single city to give you all this information, you know, based on tweets, combining all of this into a, a single map of reactivity is just going to be uh, huge. It's a huge undertaking, but it's going to be a huge difference maker as well. This is uh, footage taken from our larger UAV, the DT-26, and this is just to demonstrate the kind of military technology that is now available to, to more civilians. Um, this is actually, uh, the resolution on this isn't quite HD. Um, it's actually a bit downgraded because it was um, transcoded, but it is 520 TVL, which is 520 TV lines of live video immediately after you launch a hand-launched UAV of this fidelity is uh, pretty incredible with a steady picture like this. Um, when the UAV is outfitted with this sensor, typically it would only be on a helicopter or an airplane. Uh, it's a two kilogram sensor, so it really takes the range down of the UAV, but the ability to launch it so quickly and have this data almost immediately wherever you need it is uh, offsetting that by quite a bit. This next example is something that we're doing with um, algorithms, and we're trying to take the data to the next level. And while this isn't extremely impressive, this is just showing one of the things we can do. The image on the right is the footage from the DT-26 um, turret, and the image on the left is the actual uh, algorithm that was running on the, uh, on the UAV to show the actual movement. So whenever there's multiple moving objects on the screen, you're going to be able to see exactly where they are. Uh, this is interesting for flooding, you know, finding people, um, seeing where they're moving, finding cars, uh, helping with anti-poaching and things like that. This is another image taken from the same sensor, and this can be very vital whenever people in Jakarta, for example, have the flooding and they're stuck on their roofs. You can quickly just flip on the IR sensor in the same turret on the UAV, and then you can find the people immediately and dispatch crews exactly where they need to be instead of searching around. So this is going to be a huge difference maker in the, in the whole, the whole um, 
the whole complete package of the of the UAV um, in the smart city and the resilience. So another thing we're doing to go the extra mile and all of this data you saw previously can be with any type of UAV. It's not just a Delairtech UAV. Uh, these are just some of the things we're doing, but it can be multi-rotors as well. Uh, we're just kind of at the, the level of um, underneath military is us. So we have a, a very particular um, requirements for our products that we've developed them to and the standards. And um, so here we see, this is uh, quite interesting. This is uh, what you're seeing is human interaction with a data set. So just for an example, this is a pipeline right here, and a human is interacting and tagging these uh, vehicles, these industrial vehicles, um, and then it, it's going into our database. So in the future, these, all these vehicles are in the database. So whenever we take a data set with our UAV, we fly over an area, we get all this data, we run it through our algorithm, and it automatically detects these, these um, anomalies. I'm sorry. And then the next step on that is in the future, um, this is actually going to be happening in real time in the UAV while it's flying. So while you're flying the UAV, you're not going to see anything, and all of a sudden, boom, an anomaly is detected. If you need to see a person, a car, any type of anomaly that we can categorize and put into our database, we can add it to our system and have it automatically um, identified for the, for the user. So lastly, uh, just some other user, uh, uses. Uh, earthquakes, um, you can predict and detect building failures before a huge disaster occurs. So like I said, with the uh, fidelity of the UAV and the centimeter accuracy it produces being so close to the ground, you can get this. Uh, volcanoes, prediction, study, flying above the plume, putting sensors in the UAV to detect uh, different uh, gases inside the, the, the fumes. Uh, forest fires, radiation, uh, of course, uh, Japan suffered a very bad uh, disaster recently, and um, this will come in great, um, great use uh, uh, very soon. So illegal fishery is the last uh, huge issue, and it's going to be very, very big moving forward. Uh, I know there's already some crowdsourced data coming from that, but stopping that is, uh, is a very high priority because that is our last um, food source, and it, it affects the entire world. So um, UAVs uh, are for resilience, and it's just not a replacement tool for everything, but just another tool in the entire tool belt of the resilient city of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, if I can just pause briefly to sort of recap my takeaways from these technologists. Um, I mean, we've heard that cities effectively have the consumer grade activities going on anyway, and there is more in almost any city in the world than you would actually need if you needed to map the city. Leveraging your own environment. That's what I took away a little bit. And, then, and Dirk, I think, you know, he's also said that it's not a panacea. There's a lot, a lot of different applications, but you have to choose the right tool for the job. And you, there are still issues around fitness for purpose and regulation and safety that are quite legitimate. And there, it's basically a free fall is my, my take on this, that it's largely unregulated or illegal, in fact, in most cities in the world, despite the fact it's going on. And, and Ian, I mean, I think you've shown us that it's not just that the hardware platforms are evolving so quickly, but the software as well. The things that we can do to analyze this data is really quite extraordinary. So I'd like to ask Denise in five minutes to please tell us, how, how do we make sense of this? What do cities need to think about from a policy perspective, from a standards perspective? Not a problem. It's just as well, because originally I was told I was only going to have five minutes, so you've only got about six slides up here. Um, so just really to give you a very quick overview, OGC is the Open Geospatial Consortium and we've been around for about 20 years now creating open standards that are really focused and centred around location information. So whilst I'm not going to specifically as such talk about UAVs, what I am going to talk about is sensors and how you need to think about sensors in terms of structure and architecture and what you need to think about in terms of looking at your systems. So here are my principles for resilient cities. Whilst I think that new technology is sensational and you really need to always be looking at how you can refresh and how you can utilise new that's coming in, I think at times it's, having worked myself for 10 years in government, it's very easy to be wowed by the, the sparkly and the shiny and the amazing new that's coming in. And time and time again what I've actually watched cities do is 
invest in buying something that's new that actually another section of their government is already doing and collecting in a different way from a data perspective. So whilst I do say absolutely use and upgrade where you can, where it improves what you're doing, do ensure that you're actually also looking at what you already have and where it's being collected from. And often it's coming in from sources that you may not realize. You know, it can be data that an, uh, a school system is collecting that you might want to reuse that can actually be useful in uh, mapping disaster information. It can be the tweets, it can be social media that's being used. How do I reuse that better because it's data that's already there? But above all, particularly as we're moving into this world of big data, one of the big problems with big data is people actually taking further copies of those big data sets or creating more of the same sort of stuff and having us then having issues of processing in both storage. So really we advocate a policy, I guess, of don't duplicate. And that follows into my next um, component because again, it's fantastic to have amazing sensors collecting all this data, but access to that data is key. It's one thing to collect it, it's a totally different thing to not only then be able to process it, but also make it accessible to the different agencies that need to use it. So really consider upfront, what's the problem I'm trying to solve and who it is that actually needs to then get access to that data in order to help solve that problem. And could also that data be reused and accessed by other people for different purposes as well. The other thing I guess, and you know, again being the Open Geospatial Consortium is don't get locked in. Um, standards are one of those things that, you know, often I get up and it's like, oh my goodness, it's the standards lady, where's my pillow? I need to have a sleep. But they're also the thing that people primarily go, well, I'm building something innovative. I don't need to think about standards. I'll worry about that when I'm building a production system later on. Standards, particularly open ones, can actually enable a lot of your innovation up front. Uh, open standards in particular enable your better access to data and if you advocate for the use of them up front, you're far more likely to find that you've got innovators and companies out there that will be able to access your system multiple times without you needing to change it lots of times as well. So do consider them up front. The other one I guess I want to say is there's often a lot of um, large organisations, I guess I should say out there, I'm not going to name any in particular, that will say, I have the whole solution for you, so use my system. Again, when it comes to standards, you need to be careful and consider when you're looking at those one-stop shop solutions that they're going to allow you to innovate in the future. They're going to allow you to grow. They're actually going to allow you to upgrade in terms of your systems as well. So by advocating use of open standards, you're actually assisting yourself to future-proof in terms of what you're looking at. So in that sense, ask for open standards. And most importantly, if they don't exist, get involved and make them. Open standards around the world actually really help us to share information. And often we're, you know, most of the people I imagine in this room and certainly talking to the World Bank advocate that, that policy of open data. Um, it's one thing to, uh, to have a whole bunch of amazing data. It's a totally different thing to be able to make it available for people to use. And the more we have better standards out there for people to access that data via, the better access people will have. Um, but it's not for a bunch of technologists to sit in a room and just create standards and then force them on you. Um, standards are something that actually need to be developed in the real world. And so if you have a problem that you think can be solved by having a better standard, you should get involved with the agencies that are doing that. And so there are organisations like OGC, there are organisations like W3C, and there are organisations like ISO that you should actually be getting in touch with and working with. Now, Whilst I'm not going to get technical, I am going to give you a very quick overview of three open standards that exist in OGC that are actually directly related to sensors uh, and very much applied in a resilience and disaster component uh, in terms of use in the world. So the first one is this one, and this is our smallest standard that we have in the OGC, and it is two pages, so it's a fairly easy read for most people. OpenGeoSMS is actually a standardised way to look at how you use SMS to transfer information. And this is really important when you start talking about citizen engagement, and I'm not sure why my slide went back. When you talk about a disaster moment that's happening, everybody pulls out their smartphone. And there's a bunch of really cool apps on there that people have created and cities have created for citizens to engage with them and provide information and data. Unfortunately, what happens in a lot of those situations is the telecommunications infrastructure goes, oh my gosh, 
I can't use that much data and I can't transfer it around and I can't get access to that information. So getting a lot of that real time tweet and real time information can actually be quite difficult. But from a data perspective, an SMS is tiny. It's a very, very, very small piece of data in terms of transfer. So utilizing Geo open geo SMS within your disaster management systems as a way for people to communicate, I'm stuck here, help me. Or the flood is two meters high at this particular point on the map. Or there is a car accident or here is a building that's just fallen down or is on fire. Just getting that single piece of information can suddenly then alert the police, the ambulance, the army, and the first responders that need to get back and need to know precise location about where those people are. And because it's been sent in an SMS, it's got a far higher chance of getting to those first responders than a number of other different ways. Moving features. And this is a new one that I start to get to, to talk about, so I'm really excited about this one. Um, moving features standard is actually not quite a standard yet. It will be in two weeks when we announce it in Tokyo, so this is a bit of a sneak peek. Moving features standard actually came out of the tsunami that happened in, in Japan. Um, and what happened in there is one of the major car manufacturers realised that all of the cars that they'd been putting out had GPSs in them and decided to, unbeknownst to a lot of people, switch them on and collect the data about the movement of the cars during the tsunami. What they were then able to do, unfortunately not at the time, because of course privacy restrictions and the fact that there was a lack of a standard, meant that the information didn't get to the first responders or the people trying to respond to the disaster environment. Moving features has come about because what people want to be able to do is track where those moving things are and where those sensors. Now that sensor could be a person carrying a mobile phone, it could be a car, it could be a UAV flying around. Um, anything that might move in a city or urban context or even in any context really that's shifting around. What you can do in a disaster environment, so take that tsunami, what that data showed very instantly and quickly was that there were roads that were blocked simply because there were cars not moving on them. They could show where congestion was coming up or where the cars were actually moving towards a, um, a hazard that they needed to be reported, that they need to, to let them know about. What you see actually here is the city of Tokyo. And this is mapping that's been done to show usage and track of um, different transport routes in and out of Tokyo. So from an urban planning perspective, this is sensational data in terms of understanding which train lines are most used, where the heaviest roads are. So from a, but again, from a planning and risk perspective, you can actually also then forward plan and go, okay, well, in a disaster, if we had uh, this road blocked off, where would we be able to reroute people to? And how can we communicate with them to do that? So keep an eye out for moving features. And the last one I'll talk about is sensor web enablement and sensor things. Um, all of the presentations you've seen today are talking about UAVs, but from our perspective, a UAV is another sensor. Um, a satellite is a sensor. Your mobile phone is full of sensors. So there is a vast variety of different sensors you have out there that you are going to be trying to gather data from and make sense from into your system. What you don't want to have happen is that every time you want to incorporate another sensor data source into your system, you have to spend a fortune in terms of writing code and finding ways to interact and talk with your sensor. What sensor web enablement and sensor things allows you to do is actually have an open standard way of looking at talking to sensors and gathering data, particularly around location information. Um, so I would highly, rather than going into too much detail, I would say please go and have a look at them um, and see how they apply in your context. So that's really all I have from, from this perspective. There's the principles in terms of, uh, of that. I'm more than happy to take questions. As I said to Edward, I probably could have talked for about three or four hours when it comes to the details of what's happening in OGC uh, in this space. Um, but please come and find me and, and ask any questions. Oh, and one really shameless bit of promotion. Um, <laughs> As I said before, the, the involvement of people in, in organisations in what we do and how we create standards is absolutely vital. Um, I think certainly I've, I've had thrown at me since I've been in this position for two years now that standards bodies feel a little bit like a black box um, and people don't know what we do and they just get this standard foisted upon them at some point that they have to try and comply with. Um, the Location Powers Summit series with OGC is actually, I guess, an attempt to start a conversation with everybody around the globe about what people need in terms of our standards. And it's not meant to be technical. It's actually about talking about the problems. It's talking about what your disaster needs are in a situation. It's talking about what your planning needs are. 
And then it's looking at how the standards need to be created and developed to help respond to those problems. So our first one is actually smart cities. So it's rather topical for, for what we're talking about at the moment, and that's happening in Tokyo. So anybody who might happen to be in Tokyo at the time is quite welcome to come along. It's a free event. Um, but anyone who works in an organisation that's actually grappling at all with smart cities and looking at the context of where within their smart city, so understanding where everything is within your smart city context, they're the standards that we're working on at the moment, and we'd really like to hear from you in terms of that discussion. And that's me. So I think we need to wrap up quite soon, but I, um, I do want to offer the chance to ask one or two questions, because we did start late. Are there any questions from the audience? If not, I also encourage you to find out from this later, but we have a question from Jesse. Jesse, go ahead. Uh, uh, yes, I, I remember in the early days of Living Labs, there were a lot that were looking at disaster management and so on and so forth, and their main focus was on the behavior of citizens, uh, a parked car blocking a, an emergency route or people taking moving in the wrong direction. There was some mention of that in... in uh, your thing and and Italy in the last week has been sub there has been flooding and uh, mudslides and uh, I don't know how many people have been killed and and one of the main things that they saw in the city of Genoa is that the the city and its agencies were getting information about what was going on in aerial photographs and so on but the citizens weren't and that the citizens had organized themselves uh, using uh, Twitter and Facebook and that kind of stuff to help each other out. Uh, more people were saved by other citizens than by the city agencies and so on and so forth. It's, it's not a critique of what you're saying. It, it just seems to me that that would be, if, if I were a city mayor, my concern would be how, how can, uh, what, what work is going on? How could you interface better with applications that, that, that uh, put this data in the hand of citizens? Okay, we have one more question behind. And we'll just take these two because I think uh, people will be filling in for the next session. Um, Stefan Archer from the African Development Bank. Uh, um, somebody talked about uh, doing topographic survey between uh, 130 kilometers on the railway um, line. Probably we financed maybe some of it. Uh, are there standards already in place for topogra topographic survey using uh, UAVs? And if they are, uh, what are they? So maybe the second question is for Denise. Um, do you want to take that one first? And uh, I'll ask my panelists to think about who wants to answer the first question. I'll take that one first and then answer a bit of the other one as well. Um, specifically on drones, uh, not that I'm aware of. I know certainly um, looking at organisations like FIG, which look at surveying uh, standards perspective, that that's a certainly a conversation topic and it's one that we're having with them. I think when it comes to that, we're, we're kind of at that stage of gathering what the problems are in terms of looking at, at, um, at drones and, and what the standards are going to be in terms of how you marry that up with the existing survey standards around. Um, I, I represent OGC on an organisation called the UNGIM, which is the um, United Nations Global Geographic Information Management Committee. Uh, and that was definitely a, top a topic of conversation that we've just had in Beijing. So it's a piece of work that's now being looked at, particularly also from the legal and policy perspectives uh, of UAVs. And there's an organisation in the US called the uh, Centre for Spatial Law and Policy and a gentleman called Kevin Pomfret that's actually a lawyer that's now looking into um, a lot of that, that that's sort of area of, of what the legal implications are of that. Um, in terms of, of um, access uh, for citizens and so forth, again, I think from my perspective in standards, one of the really thing important things I think for allowing citizens to have that capacity to innovate is, is cities making their data available in such a way that it can be openly consumed. Um, um, I guess a, a personal frustration out of, out of years worth of working in government is, is when open data is made available but made available, people go, I'm, I'm I've made open data available but it's packets of data that they've got to download or it's, you know, it's PDFs or it's, you know, um, it's, it's tabular data in Excel spreadsheets. If you give citizens uh, open web services to be able to consume, that, that's real-time data that people can access, what they will innovate on top of with, um, with open source software and, 
and other sorts of tools is incredible. But, but having citizens make that information and data accessible, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be free, data's not necessarily free, um, but it's the important thing is making the tools and the data available so that they can actually build the, the tools, uh, build the systems on top of. But, um, but if you don't have that, then, then you're right, the, the citizens can't engage and they can't, um, can't necessarily find out. Uh, just to elaborate a bit on the uh, survey standards, um, I think right now the UAV industry as a whole is kind of going through a uh, maturation phase. Uh, we've reached a point where there needs to be standards for everything. So right now we're basing them off of the ground-based traditional methods. Um, but when you talk about regulations and things like that, a huge topic in UAV integration and airspace is sense and avoid. How can you use, a, you know, if, a, if a UAVs are all over the sky, eventually someone's going to collide with a manned aircraft. Something's going to happen. So it's, we have to kind of uh, find a standard for that as well. So yeah, really, uh, it's a difficult question to answer because there really isn't uh, a standard that we're adhering to. Um, it kind of is on a case-by-case -case basis. But after meeting Denise, uh, this is something that we definitely want to investigate. And uh, we really need to standardize a lot of things in this, in this industry. Um, right now, it's kind of uh, just bending to the whim of each need and going from there uh, for, for each, um, each application. Actually, I just remembered one thing. So, again, recent thing that happened at that UN GGIM thing. Uh, there is a piece of work coming called the Global Geodetic Reference Framework. Um, so, what's happened up until now from a survey perspective is that pretty much every country has its own reference framework that it uses for, for doing survey. What's actually come out of the, the UNGGIM is actually something that will now go to the General Assembly for consideration to actually have an agreed global geodetic reference framework. And from a UAV perspective, that will be a framework that the UAVs will be able to connect to and utilise in terms of being able to, to ground truth and actually um, rectify to, to where it is positionally. Not quite there yet, but, but very close and a lot closer than we've ever been to having a global system that people would, that a, something like a drone would be able to work to. And maybe Frank has uh, some insight on the availability from citizens. Sure. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the, similar to what I had shown with OpenStreetMap, which is a free online editable map, um, there's being developed right now Open Aerial Map, which is seeking to kind of take in all this drone video and um, imagery from citizens around the world and, and build a very similar map with imagery. Uh, at a more commercial level, there's a company called Mapbox, which is doing this, a very similar thing as well. So you have systems that are being kind of rolled out as we speak right now, attempting to, to be a, um, a hub or a framework for this data. Uh, of course, there's a lot of technical considerations that are going into that as well with a lot of the, the open standards. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's happening. It's, it's not a question of, of um, if, it's, it's when. It's people realize this need and making it, bridging the gap between citizens and their drones and the, the government and the, um, their needs with the data. So, um, Yeah, I, I echo everything that was said here, really. Um, just a, a small point is um, I was in New York uh, 10 days ago talking to one of the prominent uh, lawyers in, in the drone space. Uh, pretty much very similar to this topic as well, you know, democratizing the, um, the technology and having citizens go out and collect imagery and, and all the rest of it, really, really good. Um, but <laughs> he, he made, well, he started explaining all the laws that surround this, specifically in the US, especially around privacy, and it gets very, very hairy very, very quickly. You know, if you have citizens, everybody flying and collecting imagery, what does privacy mean? Well, how do you regulate it? What were the laws? It's just, it gets... You know, it gets very messy. Um, but that's just something we, we as a society and, and, and as governments have to figure out how to deal with. So I think we really need to wrap up then. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. Uh, before they leave the stage, uh, round of applause for them, please.